This is Pat Solver with the Dr. Ways In, and we're filming today from the beautiful Genentech campus in South San Francisco, and we're going to talk about lung and bladder cancer. And I have with me today uh, Dr. Alan Sandler, not Adam, but Alan, who is Group Medical Director for Lung at Genentech. And uh, we're going to start out, uh, Alan, by talking about immunotherapy and uh, why people should care about this. And, and if you could tell us a little bit about how different it is from our approaches to treating cancers, even in the recent past. Sure. Well, thanks. So um, we'll step back um, just uh, briefly about myself. I'm a former medical oncologist, so I've taken care of cancer patients, and typically that involves using chemotherapy. Um, and so one of the new advances that we're here to talk about today is that role of immunotherapy. And um, extremely high level, the concept is immunotherapy is there to turn on the immune system in some way to fight cancer. If we take a step back and, and we wonder why someone would think about using the immune system, it's because, um, you know, cancer is a for, would be a foreign substance to the body, much like a virus or a bacteria. And the immunotherapy, uh, the immune system does very nicely in fighting those off. But why is it that cancer cells are not being recognized. And it turns out that the, the cancer um, has a way of modulating the immune system and actually causing the body's immune system to turn off. And that's with uh, something that we call the, the PD-L1, PD-1 system. And, uh, and our drug, tezolizumab, serves to block that. And we can go into more details later, but the general thought is to allow the body to turn its immune system back on to fight the, the cancers independently. So that's pretty interesting that cancer has somewhere along its evolutionary pathway figured out how to turn off our immune system. So it isn't really hiding, it's, it's actually turned off the immune system. Right. And, and actually, a, a way to look at it is, um, you know, teleologically, why does this exist this way? Because it's really sort of a, um, an overdevelopment uh, of something that, that exists normally. And if you think about, for example, a, a pregnant woman who has a foreign object um, and that is not rejected, um, that is part of that immune system, that way of damping down the immune system to allow that to, uh, the child to develop. Um, and the cancer has taken that on to higher levels to allow itself to go unnoticed. And again, we can talk later about that, uh, that particular system, but that PDL1 aspect, which our drug blocks, is part of that. So tell us a little bit more about this drug, and I'm not going to attempt to use the whole name. I have to say that these new immunotherapies have some of the worst names in all of medicine. Uh, they're mouthfuls, so I'm just going to call it a Tezo, if that's okay. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit ab about what you know about how well it works and for which cancers. Sure. So um, it's a tezolizumab, just for the audience, if anybody wants to try it. But that's, um, and I'll just take, again, one more step, that what it is, it's a humanized antibody uh, that um, attacks and blocks PD-L1, uh, which is a ligand, that a protein, if you will, that binds to PD-1. And when those two are actually linked, that's what causes the immune system to be damped down. If you interrupt that and don't allow for that binding, which a Tezo does, um, that allows the immune system to rev up. So that's the premise. Now, we've studied the drug in a number of different diseases, um, which have included, not limited to, I'm not going to mention them all, but lung cancer, um, um, a form of breast cancer called triple negative breast cancer, which is breast cancer that is not hormone sensitive and uh, doesn't express HER2. It's a very virulent form of breast cancer. Um, bladder cancer, which we'll talk about momentarily. And um, in addition to renal, renal cell, kidney cancer as well. So um, what we've seen, and the very first study that we did is what we call a phase one study, when in the old days of oncology, you were just looking for toxicity, just wondering whether you could give a drug or not. But what we found, uh, quite astonishingly, was response rates in these patients it, with various forms of diseases, uh, various forms of malignancies, um, most of whom were very heavily pretreated with previous chemotherapy. And we saw response rates in the range of around 20% or so, about one out of five patients, which is really nothing short of remarkable in that particular setting. But these are people who've already failed multiple rounds of chemotherapy, so presumably their tumor has evolved over time in response to that. 
absolutely. And, and these are patients who really literally wouldn't have many other options. And so, so not only did they respond in that the tumor shrank, but perhaps as amazing or more so is that these responses appeared far more durable than what we would have expected with chemotherapy. And, and that's the other remarkable aspect. And if you think about the immune system and the memory associated with the immune system, um, it, it sort of makes sense as to why the responses would last longer. For example, if someone gets the mumps, um, and uh, they don't get it again because the immune system remembers that virus. Well, that, that sort of applies to the tumors as well and the responses. And, um, and so these responses are, are going um, longer than expected, which is pretty exciting. It's very exciting. Do you think we could uh, actually use the word cure? Um, I hope um, at, at some point that we will be able to use cure. I think um, cure in the metastatic setting uh, in this entity would be very rare. Um, we don't know. We still have, to, you know, we have to observe these patients a lot longer. But I, I will say that what we're also doing, in addition to looking at um, these patients in the metastatic setting and the previously treated, we're going to be studying and have studies going, say for lung cancer, patients whose tumors have been removed. Um, and the standard therapy is chemotherapy and then observation. And what we're going to do is we're starting a study that um, compares um, a year of atezolizumab in these patients to no further treatment. And we hope um, that that will translate into an increased cure rate where patients who otherwise would have died of the cancer coming back after surgery, well, actually the cancer won't come back and they'll be cured. Well, that's pretty remarkable. And um, I understand that you're very close to being able to submit to the FDA. Um, can you tell us um, are just two or three of the key studies, and maybe you've already done that, that have allowed you to get to the point where you can talk about submission to the FDA, I believe, early next year? That's correct. We hope uh, first quarter next year to submit to the FDA, um, both for um, a bladder and non-small cell lung cancer. And I, I'll give you I give you a little hint, but I'll, I'll give you two a uh, little more details. One in bladder, uh, where we saw a response rate of 27 percent. Um, for patients who were previously treated um, with chemotherapy in that setting. Bladder cancer is a disease where there hasn't been an advance in probably somewhere between 25 to 30 years. Well, that's pretty remarkable. Yes, and these are, these are patients who uh, tend to be a little bit older um, and also have uh, various uh, comorbidities as, um, associated with their, with their illness. And, and so, um, you know, again, that response rate is pretty amazing, along with the very uh, durable nature of those responses that we, we talked about um, before. And I think one, one aspect uh, that I, I probably should mention is, you know, how do people tolerate this drug? That's probably an important point, right, for, for, for patients because they're used to chemo chemotherapy where you lose your hair, you might have nausea, um, low blood counts, etc. So we don't, our drug, uh, Atezo, does not have those types of side effects. Because you're not poisoning the whole body with the chemotherapy. Exactly. We're relying on the body's own immune system uh, to fight the cancer. And so what you see, uh, what uh, an initial concern was, well, would that cause the body to sort of reject itself? And would you see those types of toxicities? And fortunately, the answer is no. And the routine or the more common uh, side effects seem to be sort of like a flu-like syndrome, right? A low-grade fever, maybe some fatigue, maybe some muscle aches, which we like to think of it as the body's uh, immune system being turned on, and, and you develop those sort of flu-like symptoms like you do when your immune system is turned on to fight a virus. So here we have this drug that's got pretty remarkable results, and it's going to be a lot better tolerated, it sounds like, than chemotherapy. Um, what can you tell us about when you think, I know no one can predict the regulatory process, but approximately when do you think this will be out there and ready for doctors to prescribe to their patients? Yeah, I think the, the, the thought, of course, is that uh, we'll be turning in that the um, materials to uh, the agency in the first quarter. And it'll sail right through. <laughs> and we'll have to wait and see as to how long that will be, uh, how that process will run its usual time course. So I'm sure that a lot of our listeners are going to want to learn more. They're going to want to know how they can keep their eye on the progress of this drug coming to market, where they can learn about more immunotherapy, and uh, maybe even how they could get involved in participating in a clinical trial. Right. So um, what I'll tell you um, uh, is that we have a number of clinical trials open in a lot of disease settings. Uh, we have um, a website, of course, uh, and um, a toll-free number. 
Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much and uh, congratulate you on the work that you've done and uh, wish you um, really speedy um, uh, pass through the regulatory process. So thank you very much. And thank you.